Thank you. Uh, I'm going to stand on the side because I don't want to stand behind uh, the podium. Thank you for coming out in this bad weather. It's my first visit to Wichita, Kansas. And uh, the reason why I know about Wichita State is because two Knicks went here, David Stallworth and And the X-Men is Eric McDaniel. So that's how I know about Wichita State. Because they played for the Knicks. This is, uh, we all know what month this is, and, right? February, and February is Black History Month. And so any African American that could put two words together has a job in February, and you know, schools will call you in universities, and you have so-called spokespeople for the masses. So usually I'm not home in, in February. I have to trek across this great United States of America and speak to young, bubbling students. But I really do enjoy this because for the most part, you are the people to go see my films and it's always good to have this exchange and see see faces. Growing up in Brooklyn, New York, I had no idea that I wanted to become a filmmaker. Most filmmakers know that at a very early age. That was not the case. That was not the case with me. I went, uh, my friends and I went to the movies every Saturday, spent the entire day in the movie theater eating all the popcorn we could eat and drinking all the coke we could drink and throwing stuff at the screen and trying not to get kicked out of the theater. Uh, I did not know that people made movies. You just went to the movie theater, had a good time, then you went home. Growing up, I wanted to be a professional athlete, but genetics conspired against that. <laughs> that happening, genetics and, and a, a bad hop with a hardball, I wasn't wearing a cup, and I had to give it up after that. <laughs> and so I went to college, and even upon entering college, August of 1975 at Morehouse College in Atlanta, I still had no idea what I wanted to do. And for a semester and a half, I took only elective classes and then there comes a point as some of you might know where you have to declare a major as some of you might know where you have to declare a major and and uh, I chose mass communications and that was print journalism TV radio and film Morehouse didn't have that major so I took those classes across the street at Clark College which is now Clark Atlanta University it was there that I really decided this is what I want to do. But they only had Super 8 cameras. And upon graduation, I still did not have the, the skills to become a filmmaker. I applied to, knowing this, I, had, I knew I had to further my education. So I applied to the top three film schools, USC, UCLA, and NYU. But unfortunately for me, to get in USC or UCLA, you had to get an astronomical score on the GRE. I took the test, did not get the score. But for NYU, all you had to do was submit a creative portfolio. So I submitted some of my creative writing and some of my photographs, and I was accepted. And it's there at NYU I really began to learn the craft of filmmaking, and that's how you become a filmmaker. 
by making films. For three years, you make films, your films, and you even work on your classmates' films. So you, you very rarely in the class and just out shooting, 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 and shooting some more. Historically, they let in a large class the first year, and then they kick out half of the class at the, after when the school year is finished. In film school, it's kind of strange because you don't take tests. You are graded upon your films. So unlike if you were in med school or law school, you take a test, you know, there's a certain answer and you get 80, it's 80. But when you're in film school, it's, it's based upon taste and aesthetic. So you could be a very good filmmaker and the teacher doesn't like your work or like the subject matter, whatever, and you could still be a good filmmaker. You could, you could still nonetheless be kicked, be kicked out of the, the program. And my first year, I was kicked out at the end. I did a film called The Answer, which is about a young African-American screenwriter who's hired to write and direct the $50 million remake of D.W. Griffin's Birth of a Nation. And the faculty didn't like me doing a film that attacked the so-called father of cinema. But before they had put in the final grades, they had given me a, hey, let me become a TA because I worked in uh, the equipment room. So once they found that out there, they really couldn't kick me out. So that's how I got, that's how I stuck in school. My thesis film was a film called Joe's Best Life Barbershop, but I think they're gonna show tomorrow. And I was lucky enough to win the Student Academy Award. That award enabled me to get an agent, uh, some press clippings, even a little two-minute spot on Entertainment Tonight. And I felt because I had this plaque on my mantle, my little studio apartment, and I had an agent, I could just sit by the phone and Spielberg and Lucas and Coppola and Warner Brothers and Paramount and all these companies and great filmmakers would, would call me because I was talented and I had this award because I won the Student Academy Award. But I was young and dumb and very naive. And I listened to my agent because I was new in this business and he was a veteran. And he said, just sit by the phone, Spike, and let me take care of everything. So, not knowing any better, I just sat by the phone and sat by the phone and sat by the phone. A lot of my classmates who graduated with, who graduated with me were getting jobs, were getting work, doing after school, ABC after school specials, doing music videos, stuff like that, industrial films. And I wasn't getting jack. And I would sit by the phone and sit by the phone. And then a funny thing happened. The phone got cut off and then <laughs> Then Brooklyn Union Gas came in and Con Edison. And so this woke me up and knew that I really could not rely on an agent to make my way in this industry. I decided I was, I was not going to write a script and move out to LA and knock on doors. And you have to realize the climate was different than it is now. There were not a lot of African, African American filmmakers making films. You had Richard Pryor and Michael Schultz and Eddie Murphy. That was about it. But as far as directors, it was not as it is now. So I decided the best way is to do an end around, go the independent route. And for three years, I did everything in my power to, uh, to make a feature film. I graduated from NYU in 1982. And three years later, I did a f attempted to do a film called Messenger. The reason why you never heard that film is because it never got made. I got involved with a very, very shady producer who didn't produce the money he said he was going to produce. And we were pre-production for eight weeks waiting for this mysterious wire transfer that was going to come into our account so we could shoot the film. I had gotten people like Jean-Carl Esposito and Larry Fishburne to be in the film, and, and the crew is my classmates, and all these people had put aside the whole summer to work on this film. 
And eventually, after stalling and stalling and stalling, I had to tell them that there was no movie, that they weren't going to get compensated for that time, and that's that. So as you can well imagine, my name was Mud, and rightfully so. And for me, this is really the critical point in my development as a filmmaker. And I remember going home and running the ward in the bathtub and crying in the bathtub and, and all the water draining out till I was wrinkled like a raisin. And then I said, well, let me try it one more time because I'm not a, a good loser. And I just tried, to, uh, just tried to think about where I went wrong and I committed the, the the, f the mistakes that most young filmmakers do, that is try to, where you try to be overambitious, to try to do stuff that you're not capable of. I had scenes written in that script, people jumping off roofs, helicopter chases, car chases, stuff I could never have pulled off, let alone we never would have had raised the money for that. I said, I'm not going to make this mistake again. I'm going to write a script, two or three people in a room, shoot it quick, black and white, we're going to do it just like that. And, that. and I wrote a script called She's Gotta Have It. And we shot that film in the summer of 1985. No applause needed. We shot the film in the summer of 1985. 12 days it took us to shoot that film. When we began, we only had $10,000. We had a, a, a grant from the Drone Foundation. And Monty Ross, who was a classmate of mine at Morehouse, and who would worked with me on Joe's Best Side Barbershop. We made a list of everybody we knew in the world and asked them to send us some money so we could make this film and that they made a contribution over $10, their names will be listed in uh, the end credits. And so while we were shooting the film, Monty would leave around lunchtime and wait for the mailman to come and hopefully there would be some checks. And if there were checks, we always crossed our fingers at the checks would not be from out of states. So we wouldn't have to wait 10 days for the checks to clear. During those 12 days while we were shooting, anybody that threw away the empty soda can or bottle was severely punished because in New York State, you get a nickel deposit with empties. And we saved enough soda cans and bottles to buy us another roll of film. And whenever I speak, I think it's good that you hear this because so often when you see successful people, that's all you see. You see the end product, but very rarely do you hear about the hardships they had to go through. And everybody had to do that. Nobody wakes up overnight and is an overnight sensation. I think that far too many young people want to become an overnight success, whether it's being a professional athlete, whatever endeavor they want to do. You have to invest a whole lot of hard work in that. And you really can't get around the hard work. We did not just jump out of film school and direct a film like Malcolm X that cost $35 million. We struggled for four years after finishing grad school. And then we were saving nickels together to buy X roll of film. The final cost of the movie was $175,000, which we got from a limited partnership, and with the sale of the movie to Island Pictures. We sold the movie for $475,000, and so with that sale, we were able to pay off our debts into the actors and crew who worked on deferred salary. And then the film wound up making eight and a half million dollars. And so with the success of that film, that gave me the ability to really to enter the industry in my own terms, not have to do what they want to do and, and also have, more importantly, have a creative control. I felt that was always most important to have creative control. Growing up, it always amazed me about the vitality of African American life, just looking out the window, but it was very rarely that you could see that on the screen or once in a while on television. So once I decided to become a filmmaker, it was always my goal to put that rich vitality on the screen. And when I mean that, I mean that good and bad. Because of the, of the way we've been stereotyped in the media, we have those African-American artists 
or people want to overreact all the way and make, and make sure that every image of every African American is 100% pristine, godlike, and positive. And for me, I think that's not really dramatic sometimes. And it's also not truthful. So we've always tried to have the balance between the two because we think that's reality, that's truth. And a lot of times we need to see things, even though they may be hard to deal with, we need to see that. Example like school days where we dealt with the, the petty, the, what I feel the petty differences amongst African Americans that keep us be a more unified people. I was criticized as airing dirty laundry, but you know, a lot of people still, you know, this, this complexion thing is still with us today and I felt it needed to be addressed. Another film, if you look at, if you look at like Jungle Fever, we had a character like Gator played by Samuel L. Jackson. We cannot turn our heads away from how drug addiction is ravaging our community, wiped out generations and generations of people. We just can't turn our heads and say that is not happening. So therefore, when you do this stuff, you can get criticized the same way Toni Morrison gets criticized in her novels for some of her character characterizations of black people. But it is true, and if you have that balance, I think that's what your, your, that's what your goal should be as an artist. This past year, 1986, marked my 10th year as a filmmaker, and we're very grateful that we've been able to make 10 films in 10 years. I think that as an artist, you really have to be judged by your body of work. So often nowadays, if somebody ha writes the first great novel, the first great uh, CD or a play, or as an act or role, automatically they're deemed the greatest thing since sliced bread, but I think that if you want to make an intelligent evaluation of an artist, you have to look at a body of work over a period of time, and that's what we're going to continue to do. I never wanted to limit myself just to, to feature films. We've done numerous music videos, commercials. We just formed the advertising agency with DDB Needham's called Spike DDB. We got our first job. We're going to be doing the print and TV ads for the upcoming Holyfield Tyson rematch for Showtime. We're very happy about that. Advertising is a big, big, big business, and far too often we've African Americans have been excluded from that. Last year we spent as a people $380 billion on hair products, cigarettes, beer, alcohol, hair products, sneakers. We are the biggest consumers. We buy more than anybody. And very little of the, the stuff we buy comes from African American businesses. I think that's something that we're going to have to really change as we, as we move towards the millennium because this is about ownership. Who owns what? And artists particularly have to be aware of that. The days of African American artists selling their mu music publishing for a new pink Cadillac, those days have to be over. That's the big reason why the artist formerly known as Prince left Warner Brothers. They were not given his masters. How is it that Bruce Springsteen, Madonna, Elton John are able to own their masters, but the artists can't? You know, that's how they get you. You have the no matter. They may they might write you a big check, but it's the catalog, the masters. Who owns the ownership? And I think that we as a people have to start thinking more of the entrepreneurial mode of thinking if we're going to survive into this next century. We had a, seg a small segue here. We, we had dinner with a distinguished group of people before I came here tonight, and, and I knew it was going to come up, Ebonics. 
And it was interesting to hear several of the educators try to explain why it is needed. I still feel differently after that dinner, and it seems to me that as soon as we jump over one hurdle, here comes another. And I know there is a problem amongst young African American children in learning, but Ebonics to me is not is is not the way, and I'm still not convinced. And and for people to justify, say they're tracing it back to our speech patterns in Africa. <laughs> that's a long, long stretch. And we have to be very careful about even black people, you know, making up stuff. Because there's millions and millions of Africans, excuse me, millions and millions of African Americans today who think Kwanzaa is something that was going on for centuries in Africa. That is not the case. My man made it up himself. <laughs> and for me, I see the same thing trying to stretch that Ebonics is a link to the way we spoke when we were back in a motherland. I'd be thinking, I'd be stupid, and I'd be... <laughs> Our forefathers had a, and ancestors had a lot more obstacles than we had. So why is it they were able to learn English, King's English, and today the kids can't do that? I mean, you have to think about history. You know, we weren't allowed to read nor write. You get hung for that. And yet, we knew that by acquiring these skills, we use that for our freedom. But now to revert to some bogus Ebonics thing, to me, seems very, 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 very backwards. Very backwards. And I think that it's not a language. I think there's, we have to really distinguish between a language and slang. And I think that all of us know slang but there's appropriate time for it. And we go for a job interview or some other areas, it's just not appropriate. And all this really goes back to what W. Du Bois talked about, the duality of being an African American in this country where you're from two worlds and all this Ebonics thing is about still trying to mesh and it really kind of embodies the fact that we still don't know who we are. After all this time, we're still struggling, still trying to find our place. And so hopefully, before we reach the 21st century, next millennium, we get some idea. And then once we get rid of that, then we can really start doing what needs to be done. But until we find out who we are and have our own identity, then we're still gonna be messed up running around, running around in circles. So I didn't mean to get into his speech, but I just had to speak on an ebonics mess because it, it's troubling to me. And I'm on the board of trustees at Morehouse, and I told the president, they speak, start teaching course of ebonics at Morehouse, I'm gonna rip my degree up. <laughs> because uh, we, we just can't do that. I get asked, we, we're gonna have a question and answer period after this, but usually the question always comes up, which of your films are your favorite? And I try to answer it like this, that if you ask two parents who their favorite children are, then most parents will say they have no favorites, they love all their 
children the same. But if you ask them in the darkness of night <laughs> who their favorite children are, they will say, if they're honest, I love all my children the same, but I might have my favor one child over another for whatever reasons. Maybe because they look like them, you don't know. And that's the way I feel about my films. I think of them as my children, and I love them all. But the two that are probably most dear to me are, are the ones that turned out almost exactly the way I envisioned it when I started to write those scripts. And those are Do the Right Thing and, and Malcolm X. With the heart of the film was, was Malcolm X. And Denzel and I, while we were in preparation for the film, we can go anywhere without black people telling us, don't mess Malcolm up, don't mess Malcolm up. And Denzel used to joke that we have to keep our passports honest if we have to make a break and leave the country if this film didn't turn out the way we wanted it to. Denzel was the reason why that film was a big success. And it's best acting so far. And he was dedicated. Denzel had done a play, Chickens Come Home to Roost, off Broadway several years before I was even attached to the project. But when I came on, he started to rehearse a year before we shot. Stop drinking. Stop eating that swine. Started to study the Quran because he knew that if he kept doing that other stuff, that eventually that would come out in his performance and that he felt and it was really intelligent on his part that he had to be in a place spiritually and mentally where, Den where Malcolm's spirit could flow through him as he did the role. And there were many times we were shooting that film where I had to pinch myself because I thought it was Denzel, excuse me, I thought it was Malcolm instead of Denzel. Many of those speeches that Denzel did performed in the film while we were shooting him, he would go on for another eight minutes after the the text had been finished. And we'd ask him, you know, what happened? He said, I don't know, Spike. Just the spirit. And that was evident with this performance. Denzel got robbed by the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences. <laughs> but for me, that was the biggest demonstration of how you could not let anyone or any one group validate your work. So people ask me, do you mind being passed over, not receiving nominations? We don't even think about that. That's not, that's not why we make films. That's definitely not the reason why we made Malcolm X to get an Academy Award nomination. And I think that last year's nominations really told you what the Academy thinks about African Americans in front of, behind, in front of, and behind the camera. There are over 300 nominations last year at the Academy Awards. Only one went to a person of color, a, a, a black woman. Her name is Diane Houston, one out of over 300. Many, many people were passed over. And despite what Whoopi Goldberg says as host, the fact that she hosted and Quincy Jones produced the show has nothing to do with the nominations. And that is not a demonstration, them not being racist, what I think the Academy is in a lot of ways. I think that because of the bad press that they got last year, then they go overboard to try to push one or two people forward this year. So because for the most part, Hollywood prides themselves as being the most liberal people around. While we were finishing Malcolm, we ran into financial problems. We never had 
the sufficient budget to make that film from the get-go. Everybody knew that. I knew it. Warner Brothers knew it. The bond company knew it. The bond company, if you don't know, is like an insurance company. They are paid a fee by the studio to ensure that the film does not go over budget. And if it does, they are liable for all the overages. So once we ran out of money, Warner Brothers asked me to cut the film down. We always knew it was going to be over three hours. And when I decided, knew that I was not going to do that, they let the bond company take over the film, which they promptly fired all the editors and all the people on the post-production staff. So we had no money to finish this film. And in doing research and studying Malcolm for two years prior to shooting, one of the, the great things that Malcolm talked about is self-reliance, about African Americans getting together and utilizing their resources. And so that's how we got that film finished. I made a list of prominent African Americans who have some bank, people who I, were not, who are, who I was not strangers with, who I could pick up, who would pick up my phone call. Because we knew that this is the only way that we'd be able to finish the film, the way we saw it, and not the abbreviated version Warner Brothers wanted you to see when it finally hit the theaters on November 19th. The first person I called on that list, that long, long list, was Bill Cosby. And I asked Bill, how's he doing, and how's Camille doing, and how's the family doing? And, and he said, how much do you need, Spike? And, <laughs> so since Bill was the first person on the list, I didn't want to be greedy and mess everything up. So I gave Bill the low number, and he said, come by my accountant's office in the morning and the check will be there for you. And I said, I'll be there at 8. He said, well, they don't open up till 10, so. <laughs> but I took the subway into Manhattan and was there, and the check was there, and ran to the bank to deposit it before anyone could change their mind. And the next call was, was Miss Winfrey in Chicago and traded pleasantries with her. And he said, I saw her photograph of her and Stedman, jet photo of the week, and she's looking mighty slim and trim, and that dye is working. You look great. And I told her the plight that we were in, and she said, how much do you need, Spike? And I said, well, you know, we got Bill already. Let me give it a high number. And so we gave Ms. Winfrey the high number, and she said, uh, You'll be there tomorrow morning, FedEx. So we got that check and ran to the bank. Then we called up Magic and told him the predicament we were in. And Magic sent the check, and we're happy about that, and ran to the bank, and then called Michael Jordan and told him the predicament we were in. And, and one thing about Michael, he's very competitive. He doesn't. <laughs> money is very competitive. He doesn't like to lose in basketball, tiddlywinks. Craps, bidwis, whatever. So I made a, a point of telling him how much magic gave, so. <laughs> then he came through and Janet Jackson, Tracy Chapman, artist formerly known as Prince, and a, a patron of the arts, a woman out of DC named Peggy Cooper K. Fritz, and all these people, all these African Americans, came together and wrote big checks so we could finish the film. They could not write it off as a tax. It was not a tax write-off, and I could not give them a piece of the film. They just really did it, so because of their love of Malcolm, and, and they wanted you to see the film the way we intended to be. And it's from that experience with 
Malcolm X, that is how we financed my last film, Get on the Bus. Get on the Bus was financed by 15 African American men solely. The studio did not finance that film. We just felt that with the subject matter, it would be more than appropriate if we could find African American men who would finance this film. And some of the people amongst, amongst those 15 are Wesley Snipes, Will Smith, Danny Glover, Robert Guillaume, Charles Smith used to be on the Knicks, now in the San Antonio Spurs. All these gentlemen wrote checks so we could finance this film. And even though $2.4 million is a small amount, it still was a long, hard task in trying to raise the money. And in a lot, of, a lot of ways, the reason why it's so hard is a lot of us still have slave mentality where we don't trust each other, especially when it comes to financial matters. I mean, it is no mistake that 95% of the players in NBA, which is 80% black, have white agents. I asked Buck Williams, who's president of, pres of, the, pres of the Players Association, and he's on the Knicks, why is that? He says, brothers don't trust black people. And I think this is something that we really have to get over. It's a vestige of slavery, but we do not trust each other. Many people still today, you know, when it comes to money matters, whether they need a lawyer, financial planner, stockbroker, you know, I love black people, but I let them mess up my money. Oh, no, 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 no. We hope that with the coming together of these men, this would serve as an example of what we can do that we can come together and work together. All the investors in this film received their initial investment and interest before the movie opened, and that's something that's unheard of. The film cost $2.4 million, but we sold it to Columbia for 3.6, and so everybody got paid, and, and I think that's the way that we have to finance films in the future. A lot of times, Hollywood would not want to do what you want to do. We've been trying. I thought Jackie Robinson, I was going to make Jackie Robinson. The budget was between 35 and $40 million. Couldn't get the money. We we're hopefully going to make the film, but cannot, studio will not put up that type of money for what they feel is a black baseball film, even though Jackie's one of the most important Americans in this century, period. We wanted that film to be out this year, this year marks the 50th anniversary of Jackie breaking, breaking the color barrier. These are things, these are things that we have to really all deal with. And today, at the press conference, I was asked by someone, what can African American moviegoers do? Well, I think that if you want to support African-American films, you have to go see them. And you can't wait three weeks. Right now, there is a glut of movies in the marketplace. Too many films are being made. So the films are just lined up like it's a runway. And that opening weekend is critical that Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, if you don't show up, if you don't have the numbers there, your film is gone. You don't show up Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the film is gone. And can't say, well, I wanted to go, but by the time I got around to it, it was gone. It's gone because you didn't show up that Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And when you go, it's also important, paramount, that you check your ticket stub and make sure that the movie that, you, that you're paying your good hard, 
hard-earned money for. The movie that you paint is a movie on your ticket stub. Because there's this particular practice whenever African-American film comes out that might make a lot of money, strange things start to happen. You go to the theater, going to see Malcolm X, but your ticket stub says Dracula or Bodyguard. And whatever that was on the ticket stub, that's where the money goes to. I know it's not a habit. If you go to a concert or a game, you look at your ticket stub because that shows you where your seat is. Movie theater, you just sit down anywhere. But it'll take you five seconds to just make that look. And if you see things aren't kosher, raise hell because grand theft is happening. That is not supposed to be. If you're going to see a film, I mean, something that says something else on your ticket stub, you got to make it stink. And far too often, another thing, we complain as a people how there's only one type of film being made by Hollywood as far as African Americans are concerned. The hip hop, drug, shoot 'em up, rap, violent type of film. And I can go anywhere. Wichita, Morgantown, Virginia, Brooklyn, New York, anywhere. The same thing, people come to me. When are, you, when are you guys gonna make some more movies that I could take my family to, or there's not people getting killed and all this other stuff? When those films come out, we don't go. And for the most part, Hollywood will only finance films that they think they're gonna get a return on their investment. It's a business. They're not gonna just make a film out of the goodness of their heart. So when the film, like Get In The Bus, comes out, and Thirty, forty, fifty. That makes eighty-five cents, <laughs> and then three weeks later, set it off comes out and makes eight and a half million dollars the first three days. Then, number one, the studios every morning they're looking at what the grosses are. Well, I don't know. You want to make this type of film anymore? You know, black people they seem to be like in this type of film. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling self prophecy. And it's getting harder and harder and harder to make films that go outside that formula. Now the new formula is the, the African-American sexual comedy. So now you're all going to be hit with films like Booty Call. <laughs> That's a film. I'm not making it up. Booty Call, Love Jones, How to Be a Player, and I'll put my money on, I know what film's going to make money, which films we're going to go to. And this is even, an even worse scenario, it's gone over to television. I don't even watch, I mean, I watch sports, because I can't watch UPN, You People's Network. <laughs> now, who's going to be brave enough to raise a hand and say they watch Homeboys from Outer Space? <laughs> UPN doesn't come to, uh, You should be happy then. <laughs> You're not missing nothing. So you never seen home. You never had the pleasure. You never had the pleasure of seeing homeboys from outer space. You've seen it. You love that show, right? <laughs> oh, WB, we brothers. <laughs> We Brothers and You People's Network. Huh? <laughs> I 
I mean, I saw some old Amos and Andy. Those are better than this new stuff. And they weren't trying to front, you know. They just straight out bowing and shuffling. You know, these are the... <laughs> Do we have a microphone in the audience? Because it's supposed to be... No. No microphones in the audience for the, the question and answer period. You just have to s shout, scream it out. Okay. Before we do that, I'd like to just say, please do not ask me how do we end racism, prejudice, <laughs> hunger, how we save the rainforest. Because I do not have the answers to that, and it'll be a waste of time. <laughs> waste of everybody's time. Yes, can you stand up, please? And I'll try to repeat the question. Um, how would you suggest that, okay, as, as far as movies being advertised on TV down here, we don't get anything. You see, we don't have, I mean, we don't have any. Uh, you have BET on cable? Yeah, this changed to 41, way up on the, you know, in the back of the. Uh, in the cable uh, book or whatever. But I mean, we get movies advertised on TV and then you go to the theater and you have to ride around to find out where they're showing. You know, like they're scared to let our people come into the theater to watch, you know, to get entertained ourselves. We're good enough to pay our, our money to see Arnold Schwarzenegger do whatever, but when it comes to a black man, we can't even get it here. So yeah, so when films open here, in Wichita, they don't take out ads for black films? It's very seldom that black films do come here. You say it's very seldom that black films come here at all, right? Yeah. Well, how, how many African Americans here? 30,000? 35, I think 35,000 is more than enough to support one movie theater that can cater to the African American audience. And I think that if everyone called the theaters, the theater owners, sent him faxes, sent him letters, petitioned him, he would have to program accordingly. I just feel that would happen, but if nobody takes action, then it just keep on being the way it is. Yes. From 165th Street and Grand Concourse. I have a question for you. Can we foresee in the near future a uh, one solid, uh, uh, like LA Babyface and uh, yourself, Mr. Cosby, coming together in one mass media conglomerate to give us what we need as a people? The question is will we see in the future the coming together of people like Babyface, myself, Bill Cosby, to come together like David Geffen, Jeffrey Katzenberg, and Steven Spielberg did to form DreamWorks. I think that that's going to happen. But again, I really have to go back to that slave mentality. I think that for the most part, you have different camps. And we don't when you're unconfident that you're going to be around for a while, you're like, I got mine. So you have a person over here, a person over here, somebody over here, somebody over there. And so when we get rid of that mentality, then you'll see the coming together. And I think that the way we funded Get On The Bus is the beginning of that. And you will see things like that. I think a group that we all need to look out for is an NBA Players Association. They got a new guy running an association, Billy Hunter. And there's no more visible group of African Americans in the world and more wealthy than the brothers playing in the NBA. And they're really working on trying to raise the consciousness of these brothers so they can really start making the moves. Because if they get together, they can really be the beacon to let the brothers in NFL and Major League Baseball get on board too. Because not everyone wants to go out like Michael Irvin. 
I was a Pookie's character that threw the trash can through the window. And do the right thing. Why was it Mookie's, why, why was it the character Mookie that threw the garbage can through the window? That, that film came out in 1989, and that is a, the question I always get asked about. And what's interesting, since 1989, the hundreds of times that question has been asked, not one African American has ever asked me why Mookie threw the garbage can through the window. It's always been white Americans. And I think that, I'm not indicting anybody, I think that really just shows you how differently we can see, see things. I think the OJ trial is a big example of that. The reason why Mookie threw the garbage can through the window is because he just saw his best friend get murdered in front of his, his eyes by New York City's finest. And at that time, Sal's famous pizzeria was a symbol of everything that was wrong. The police, racism, the mayor at that time, Ed Koch, that's why I threw the, the garbage can through the window. <laughs> yes? What do you think you got out of Morehouse that you can't get out of any other school? Any other school or any other white institution? What do you mean? Any other, any other combined race college? What do you think that out of a only African-American male college, do you think you got out of that that you wouldn't have at NYU? The question is, what what do I think I got out of going to a predominantly black school like Morehouse versus going to a white institution? I think that at Morehouse I got a nurturing from my faculty, from my administration, from my teachers that I might not have gotten somewhere else. And I felt that the fact that I was amongst my own, it was a great learning experience. And I think it's no different than why a Notre Dame was formed, or Yeshiva, or Brandeis, or Brigham Young. So I don't really think there's anything radical about an African American wanting to go to a predominantly black college. Last question. Yes. Uh, what advice do you have for young African American students that you wish that you had when you were a student to help them? The question is, what advice do I have for young African Americans? It could be for any students. What advice do I have for any students that I've liked to be given when I was a student? I recently went back to Morehouse and I, and I went to the admissions office and I told them to pull up my transcript. And I was, I forgot how many C's I got in school. And the reason why this was is because I did not apply myself. I was lazy for the most part till I decided I wanted to become a filmmaker. Then I got excited about that major. But for the most part, I only did what the teacher asked, never did anything more, and just not really try as hard as I should have. And, and that's my big regret, that I did not do everything I could have. And I think that if you're in the position out there now, you know, you really have to, don't go that way because it's, it's even more competitive than it was when I graduated. I'm gonna be 40 March, March 20th, but when you graduate, you're gonna, it's gonna be much more competitive than when I came out of school. And if, you, if your grades, you know, people are gonna look at your pedigree, and if it's not tip top, you're gonna be shit out of luck. And excuse my language, but that's the truth. And so you could mess around and party and hem and haw and half step if you want to, but when you leave here, things will be much different. And the people can be successful, the ones that took their four years here seriously. So just be serious about your, be serious about your uh, education. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and in closing, before you run out, 
I would like to say that I say my prayers every night because I'm very fortunate to be, to make a very, to have a very comfortable living doing what makes me happy, and that's making films. And 99% of the people in this world go to their grave having slaved at a job that they hated. And for you students here, these four years are very crucial because it can determine what you can be doing for the rest of your life. And so really try to find what it is that you want to do and pursue that. Thank you.